this week on the Back Table Podcast. And I would say that we as radiology and radiologists are going to be disrupted. Disruption does not mean replaced. Disruption does not mean, you know, the robots are going to take over radiology like tomorrow. It'll happen probably in 40 something years when we're all retired. And like also when it happens, medicine as we know it will be changed. It, it will, every single specialty will be changed. It's not just radiology. But I will say disruption first, radiology. Because if you look at AI and other fields like cardiology, etc., they are using it as an adjunct in a very minor way. You know, like let's have the, you know, cardiologists do imaging as well. Let's let's use it with coronary CTA, cardiac MR, et cetera, et cetera. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Innovation Podcast. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. This is our next installment in the Back Table Innovation Show where you will hear stories from physician entrepreneurs who are helping to drive healthcare forward through med tech innovation. Today we've got another great episode lined up. We're going to be discussing AI applications in healthcare, uh, specifically deep learning and, and how we can make healthcare globally accessible and affordable using deep learning with special guest, Dr. Samir Shah. Welcome, Samir. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's it's an honor to be on this amazing podcast. Thanks, man. I don't know if you captured or if you caught any of our prior episodes. It's been a while since we covered AI. You know, we had we had um, Chris Mancy with Viz. I think that was the first one we had on, you know, it was like this is a couple of years ago. And then we had uh, Elad Wallach with, um, with ADOC. I'm trying to think other, but yeah, I mean, we, we've covered a few times, but, you know, it's there's so much to cover. There could be a whole show just dedicated to AI, I, as you know. I know. I keep waiting for people to get sick of the uh, topic, but, uh, <laughs> you know, as we get more and more loaded down with films, I think uh, people are looking to it more and more. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and um, also for the audience, in case they haven't heard those, maybe go back and listen, but the I was actually, actually checking out some of your talks on the Cure.ai website. Because you cover, you know, you, there's there's actually a bunch of talks on there, which is great. There's a lot of learning stuff for people who want to take a deeper dive. Yeah, it's a great say. website. It's, it's, yeah. it's really good. It is. It's really good. It's. I was showing our webmaster, like, it's really easy to navigate and kind of find what you're looking for. You know what I mean? If you're looking for AI for lung cancer, there it is. If you're looking for AI for pharma, there it is. You know, there's some stuff there. So I really, I really did like it. And, and I'm... It was great for me, you know, as a radiologist coming into the company, I was like, what's the best resource? You know, is there like, and to just have to go to the website to learn everything about the organization was really good because it's yeah. so simple. So it easy. Is. It is. Simple is good. Simple's Yeah, simple is good. It, it helps. Yeah, so for us it, IR guys. <laughs> yeah exactly. And we're going to try and cover this topic in a simple manner today, but First off, I'd like to start with intros. Tell us about your professional journey. How did you come to Cure after becoming an, AI, an IR? I mean, do you still practice IR? So I'll let you dive into it. Yeah, it's an interesting story for sure. It, uh, my story is uh, kind of interesting even to me. So I grew up in Northern Jersey, went to school at BU in Boston, college, med school. Then I did my training at UPenn. I had done a surgical internship. I've changed my mind and quit a lot of things. So I always tell my kids, uh, don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to, you know, change directions. That's what life's about. So I was an ENT resident and actually was in Pittsburgh, matched in Pittsburgh, switched to radiology, went to the other side of the state, UPenn and Philly. And when you are surgical internship, the uh, IR guys at Penn find you and they start recruiting you from day one, which I was happy to be recruited because uh, it was awesome. Um, so I ended up actually leaving Philly for fellowship. And uh, that was like my first big decision regarding IR. At the time, I think most of my attendings, it was, it was 2002. It was like the first time they'd ever thought about a match. If you, it, you know, these were the early days. And um, the attendings, everybody was like, my new vascular, right? That's the place to go, what you want to do. But Things were starting to change then. And I I kind of said, these surgeons are somewhat relentless. I wonder if, you know, I should broaden my training. And when I was a first year, there was a fellow and 
his name was Riyadh Salem, and he was at Beaumont, and he was going to go to Northwestern. So I interview at Northwestern, and it's like Ritz-Carlton, brand new hospital at the time, 20, 20 years old plus now, 25 years old. But uh, it was uh, immediately, I sensed that it was cutting edge, and it was going to be even more cutting edge with Riyadh there with oncology. So I ended up going to Northwestern, had just simply the most brilliant year. I come out of practice and I moved to Pittsburgh, back to Pittsburgh, where I met my wife during my internship. Uh, the job market was hot and they were offering sign-on bonuses. So I joined the largest pa private practice group in Western PA at the time. And uh, no one was doing IO there. Uh, but of all cities to choose, I chose a bad city for IO because it happened to have the largest transplant center in the United States at UPMC. And so liver patients, even though I was in the suburbs, they were all directed to, to UPMC. So it was, it was uh, incredibly hard. Um, it wasn't going to succeed. Um, I will tell you, I had a fantastic five years as an IR. I practiced IR exclusively, almost exclusively, like 90% of the time in private practice. It, we were like five guys in the suburbs of Pittsburgh and we were like, we should start a fellowship because we were doing all the arterial cases. The hospital didn't have, the main flagship hospital didn't have a, a pure vascular surgeon and they had CT surgeons who were so overwhelmingly busy that they were like, whatever you can do in a vessel, do it. Covered stents hadn't even come out then. Drug drug eluding stents hadn't even come out yet. Nitinol was like new. I mean, it was early days. It was fantastic. And yet we were doing UAEs. Uh, we were doing vertebroblastis, kyphoblastis. All these things were new. Uh, endovenous laser ablation. This was all being done new. I learned more in my like first year, three years of practice than in fellowship. And, um, you know, tried to to build an IO program, it, almost if I trained later, it would have been easier. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. it was so new. It was Riyadh's right. first year as an attending. A little bit too Northwest. new. Yeah. A little yeah. bit too new, you know, <laughs> like, like there were so many easy ways to say no back then. Like, oh, the, the, the billing people don't know what you're doing, so you can't do it. You know, the, the nuclear medicine people don't know what you're doing, so you can't yeah. do it. And so kind of I like, often uh, think a little later. now. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's, it's too new almost, right? It's, it's people too are, new. So like, how did you, how did you end up transitioning into the AI space? Oh, two more people that we had on recently, Wujin Kim and, and yep. uh, Matt, Matt Lundgren. And Matt sounds like has a very similar kind of pathway as you do in terms of like practicing IR goes into AI, but had been doing a bunch of AI research. So I want to, I want to hear, you know, how, yeah. how you made this transition. I I, uh, I hate to compare myself to Matt Lundgren because you know he he's, he's smarter, better looking, and 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 uh, you know just a nicer person overall. Uh, but um, it is funny because you know him and I happen to be two kind of IR folks in the AI space that didn't necessarily do an informatics fellowship. We didn't do the Maryland informatics fellowship. We didn't do this and that. We're kind of self-taught. Kind of he's a savant and I'm just an idiot. But this is interesting. So I, five years into practice, my practice kind of goes belly up bankrupt, okay? Multiple pressures at the time. You might even be too young to remember the Deficit Reduction Act. And UPMC went from like a local academic hospital to just like metastasizing across the state, across the world. And it took over so many community hospitals. There were so many factors. Um, outpatient imaging was kind of hit hard by... Heimar, which was the Blue Cross Blue Shield in Pittsburgh, and um, we had imaging centers, and they were done within 18 months. And of course, you know, the competition just built imaging centers across the street. So I was left in Pittsburgh, having built a house in the house I'm in right now, thinking, you know, at the time, everybody thought, you join a practice, you stay there for 30 years. My wife was pregnant with my second kid, and my father-in-law was actually passing away in the ICU for six months. You know, it was a terrible, terrible time in my life. And I end up calling my co-resident. By the way, Wujin was my junior resident. But um, I call my co-resident who actually, it was a crazy time in radiology, a lot of change. 
PAX had just been started, voice dictation had started, and in residency, Telerad had just started. And he was in Australia, and he was like medical director of something. And I was like, what are you doing over there? And let me tell you my sob story. And he's like, you should join my group. And I'm like, dude, I'm in Pittsburgh. I can't move to Australia. And he's like, you're not getting it. We read remotely. And you, this, what you would actually sit in your home in Pittsburgh. We're looking to hire people in the U.S. for the first time. And I was like, all right, this sounds great. And he said, let me introduce you to my boss. It was Paul Berger, the, the, the founder of Night Off, the father of teleradiology, kind of in many ways with Bill Bradley. And um, he ended up saying, you know, at the time there was even a plan to like build imaging centers and do do all sorts of exciting stuff in 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 radiology in teleradiology and so i ended up joining nighthawk and i was kind of like the one of the first people in the us and so nighthawk at the time was like 100 rads dude that was the biggest practice in the united states you know yeah, the, nobody had heard of anything so big at that time right um right. and so where you I am at? getting to I am getting to AI. Uh, trust me. <laughs> so, so I was a teleradiologist for like, if you look at my career in like five year stints, this was like the next five year stint. I was a practicing telerad. Within a couple of years, you know, after the financial crash, all the Australian rads kind of moved back to the U.S. Finals started. You couldn't do finals from abroad, so like you were all these pressures for rads to come back. I was already here. I was already working with the sales team. So I ended up becoming one of the medical directors of Nighthawk. Nina Kotler was on the West Coast, for example. Uh, she was my um, counterpart. She's also somebody who, who, who started in Telerad like me and kind of reinvented into an AI guru. Uh, I'm not a guru, but she is. And so I would say that uh, the next five years of my life, I've transitioned more and more into an administrative role because private equity started coming in. Nighthawk was acquired by BRAD. If you remember, they became a mega practice. I stayed there for seven years and, you know, eventually became senior medical director of the practice. We learned a ton from my CMO and kind of managed our accounts. And at the time, BRAD had like 800 clients, you know, practices. It was everywhere across the U.S. So I just basically got a Rolodex of every private practice in, in the U.S. almost and that really helped me. Um, so I ended up getting recruited by Rad Partners because Nina was already there and she said, why don't you join us at Rad Partners? So I went over there and, you know, did some growth stuff. And I also uh, helped build their teleradiology group, uh, which is Matrix. Had, had a great five years there and started to have some other things that I wanted to do. You know, AI started for me at Rad Partners. Yeah. Um, what year was that? It was like late 2018, I'll say. Okay, yeah. And I think that, I will say that if you really want to know where AI started for me, I'd say it was NLP. And it was VRAD actually. So my CM at all, O and I would like take a thousand reports and we would like highlight in different, five different colors, every sentence in a report, okay? And we would characterize the sentence, is it normal? Is it incidental? Is it negative? Is it positive? Or is it critical? You know, all these different things, a different color for each one. And I'm like, you know, Ben Strong, is, who's the CMO to this day, I was like, Ben, what are we doing here? You know, like, what is it? He's like, it's called natural language processing. Like this, I didn't even know, nobody called it AI even in 2017. Pretty soon it was called AI. I go to Rad Partners. ADOC is this small Israeli company that is, uh, you know, almost everybody was from Israel at the time. It's right, that right. small. Yeah. And they're working on our computers and, you know, installing there was three, right? Stock. Three co-founders, Elad and like two others, I thought. Elad and two right. others. So this was a yeah. little bit after that. Okay, uh, I got They it. were probably like yeah. 15 at the time, to be honest with you. And they're like, we're going to put this widget on your computer. And I'll tell you, it was fantastic. I just, from, from the get-go, I actually remember, this is interesting, I'll tell you. I remember telling them, this is great that you have this PE algorithm, but I'll be honest with you, I'm an interventional guy. I look at the vessels with a pattern. I don't miss PE. 
Yeah. That's what I told him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Such an arrogant statement to make. <laughs> I don't know why I would say something like that. And of course, the next day, they ended up saying, oh, Dr. Shaw, you know, you missed this PE. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And I'm like, oh, I'm human. I miss things. And uh, after that, it was like I was a total convert, totally hooked on AI, did everything I could to help adoption, push adoption, push integration into packs and workflow. So we did a lot of things in those early days at Matrix. Um, you know, we started with like two or three algorithms with ADOC. And then, you know, Rad AI came along with Wu, Wu Jin, um, soon to join eventually Wu Jin and Bill. But Jeff Chang was a teleradiologist at, at Greensboro Radiology. And I started with him and he's like, it's going to ingest some of your reports and it's going to make your impression. And dude, I dictated a test x-ray and I'm like, pulmonary vascular engorgement, bilateral pleural effusions, uh, larger than previously, cardiomegaly, and the impression spits out acute decompensated congestive heart failure. And I was like blown away. It was like magic. And I'm like, how did, how did it know that? And uh, that's, AI, that's AI. Who wouldn't be hooked, right? Yeah, um, that's incredible. That is incredible. Yeah. I ended up going to Envision Radiology um, in, in uh, uh, Florida, Envision Healthcare. And their teleradiology practice was an amalgamation of many practices. Um, I spent a year there. It was tough. It was challenging because they went in, they were owned by KKR and they went into chapter 11. Uh, but during that time, I learned how to implement IR. I'm uh, sorry, AI. And okay. um, that was into really a big helpful. practice. Yeah. Yep. And so yeah. I knew for my next move that going to an AI company would be a great move for me especially with my varied background. And I met Cure folks at RSNA and they met me. This was actually in 2022 at RSNA. They met me, I met them. And like, I think they were looking for a CMO that had a different kind of experience. And I was looking for something in AI and it was like a match made in heaven. You know, it took, it took a while for me to get over there, but I got there in the middle of 2023 and, you know, been here since late 2023. So I, this is like seven months in. Oh, fantastic. So I always think about the interview we did with Elad and he was talking about, you know, RSNA five, six, seven years ago, there was tons of people in the AI space and then it kind of got whittled down to like some three or four big players, right? The ones that we've already mentioned in addition to Cure. Was, it, it, was that the case at RSNA 2022 or, or, do, or do you now see more companies coming out um, now that we've, they, there's, there's been success in the, in the space, you would say, especially yeah, in radiology? It, it, I think that to me, I, I agree with a, a lot in terms of the change, but like for me, 2022 RSNA was a mental change for radiologists. Instead of saying for the first time, instead of saying, AI, let's see what it is. They were like, okay, we're ready to implement AI. Yeah. Uh, it was yeah, a, yeah. it was definitely a mental switch. Yeah. And it, it crossed the chasm, right? You went from early adopters to mainstream, basically. Mainstream. That's yeah. exactly right. And yeah. you know, all the big companies, Aaron, were actually outside the US. Like Viz is technically Israeli and um ADOC and Lunit is from Korea and we're from India. And, um, you know, there's all these uh, analyses from Europe, et cetera, uh, Australia. And um, I think it all relates back to the fact that we have the FDA here in the US. And like in Europe, you go to a hospital and they use Cure and they use like 50 of our algorithms for chest x rays. Here, you have to have FDA approval. We've got like six approvals because it takes so long and so much money to get one approval. You know, it takes a million plus dollars and a year plus. So it's so weird because this is the U.S. We're the we're the most advanced in everything, but not necessarily AI. Right. Yeah. There's restrictions around that for sure. We'll, we'll get into that. I do want to. I know you give talks on the subject of you know deep learning and help educate. And now, as you said, it's it's gotten more mainstream. I think you know, radiologists are more receptive to this being part of their workflow because they, they now they see how it can, you know, everybody's overwhelmed in 
you know, there's shortages now. So like, they're like, we need help now. We need help yesterday. So they're definitely more receptive to it. So, but I would, I would just start out like, what's been the most common question you get asked by docs who are maybe even still skeptical? The key question that they ask, number one, every time, is this thing going to slow me down? And it is such a reasonable question, as you obviously know, because so many things have been put on our desktop, on our workstations over the last 20 years. I mean, start with voice recognition. I, I remember the day they implemented it at UPenn. Murray Delinka was uh, my attending in, in MSK, you know, like a giant. And he was like, oh, they're going to cut our productivity by 25% instantly. And he was absolutely right. Yeah. Absolutely right. Yeah. No, and I, so, so many things slowed us down. And yeah. we don't have time to be slowed down. Yeah, you covered that in your uh, interview with Saurav Jha, um, where you were talking about dictation, and he was like, I don't, th it's to this day, I don't think it makes a big difference in my, like, it does not improve my workflow. Um, I, I, and I sometimes I think he says some, some of that to just be as just, sparring. Yeah, exactly, or, right, yeah, yeah, totally. But, you know, I worked in an outpatient imaging center for a few years, and uh, it was all still being transcribed. And um, I was shocked because I had been trained on PowerScribe, I had practiced with PowerScribe for five years up to that point. So that's all I knew. And then I was like, wait, what? I was like, is this the 80s? Like, and it was just because that's the way they had already always done it. But I actually found it, it did really help my workflow, especially getting stuff read. Now you did have to go back and edit what they, what they wrote. But it actually, when it comes to knocking out the list, I found myself faster. I, I don't know if there was something to it, you know? Yeah. It was counterintuitive almost because you would, I would remember in the very early days, like no packs, no voice recognition. You could just tear down a wall, uh, an alternator full of film so quickly. And you had so many comparisons. You would actually talk about progression and packs has kind of changed that workflow completely. And so is voice recognition, you know, your eyes go ping ponging. And that is the worst thing you could right. possibly do. Right. You know, right. You can't, you can't. There's wear and tear on your eyes. Yeah, exactly. And your concentration for sure. Concentration. Um, it's just not good, I think. So, okay. Well, so you answered that question. In your opinion, so we, we're, we're definitely going to cover more radiology, but in your, in your opinion, just what you know about AI now in healthcare, what do you, what do you think are the particular sectors of healthcare that are most ripe for disruption? Clearly, it's disrupting a bit in radiology, and, and we'll, we'll get into, like, is there really stuff to fear for radiologists? But um, anything else in healthcare that, uh, you, you know, we talked about we talked about dictation, but anything else that you see that's, like, out there working present day? Yeah. In terms of, you asked a very specific question. You asked disruption. And I would say that we as radiology and radiologists are going to be disrupted. Disruption does not mean replaced. Disruption does not mean, you know, the robots are going to take over radiology like tomorrow. It'll happen probably in 40 something years when we're all retired. And like also when it happens, medicine as we know it will be changed. It, it will, every single specialty will be changed. It's not just radiology. But I will say disruption first, radiology. Because if you look at AI and other fields, like cardiology, et cetera, they are using it as an adjunct in a very minor way. You know, like let's have, you know, cardiologists do imaging as well. Let's, let's use it with coronary CTA, cardiac MR, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at internists or any doctor that sees patients, the thing that you hear about now a lot is ambient, you know, recognition of the patient conversation and transcription of that a summarization, um, patient summaries, which are obviously a great use case for generative AI. That's not going to disrupt that specialty. That's going to just make them more efficient, right? I think disruption, you look at us. Why? Because these are pixels on our screen. And souls equals able to be seen by computer vision. And then what do we do with those images? We put them into words generative AI. So that's going to change everything. It seems to happen every 20 years or so in radiology, you know, like I said, 
around the turn of the millennium was right when PAC systems and, and voice recognition came. We are now going to see the next phase, you know, because we have we have pseudo pseudo large companies that that kind of control these marketplaces. I'd say, let's say you're a, a, a PowerScribe user or a, a modal a fluency uh, u- user. They're kind of equivalent, right? They have good recognition. They have great efficiency to macros, et cetera, et cetera. And you look at the PAX systems. Like, I remember a time when people would not want to switch jobs because they were like, I don't want to get to know another PAX system, Right. And now the PAC systems are so interchangeable that nobody says, I'm not going to switch a job because of the PAC system. It used to be uh, when we would hire at VRAD, the training would, like, I remember talking to a RAD that said, I was vomiting all last night because the thought of me changing PAC systems was so unnerving. And the training would, like, go for days and days. But now people, RADs are just relaxed because they, they know figure it out. They're all very similar. Yeah. They're all very similar and they actually realize muscle memory is going to come. So if you take that premise that all these pack systems are kind of equivalent, none of them are kind of powered by AI like we need them to be powered by AI. Bruce Hillman said, right study to the right radiologist at the right time, right? That needs AI. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, if you're not comfortable with hip MRIs, don't send them to that radiologist. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and again, I think that, um, Telerad and my background in Telerad and, you know, um, uh, same for Nina Kotler. I think that being in that space, we kind of immediately realized that like, it's not just study to rad. It's like, is that rad credentialed? Are they on at 2 AM that week? Or is it the week that they're not on, you know? And what are the chances that hospital is going to send a prostate MR and that we have the reader on? Like the complexity suddenly needs a supercomputer to figure Absolutely. it out. Absolutely, yeah. So that's a great application, actually. Right radiologist, right place, right time. That sounds actually fantastic. But then you got to have like it can't be this sort of RVU based because if you're getting assigned like what if you're only get, you know you're really just the chest X ray guy, right? I mean. That's going to be tricky. Yeah, you know what I mean? um, it, it, it is tricky. It's super tricky. You know, I remember, so I was there in the early days of Telerad when we worked differently, right? Like we were like working really in a productivity way. And most groups were in kind of a socialized group where everybody earns the same, et cetera, et cetera. And slowly over the years, you saw them. On-site grads work like us in Telerad, doing more productivity-based stuff, more productivity as part of their uh, income and everything else, and they were working faster, 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 faster. And it's interesting how I saw that happen over time. And the key question always was, get the right person to the right study at the right time. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing is quality, right? It's like not all MRIs are created equally. Not all CT or PE protocols are done you know, especially in community hospitals, right? Are there any AI ap- applications to help with that? Where like, hey, sorry, this is this PSA is not diagnostic. Like, you're gonna have to rescan, basically. Yes, there are the applications that are going to happen for not like okay, identifying you know PE, identifying head bleed, etc. We're talking about actually improving quality and making a diag- a non diagnostic study into a diagnostic one. That is going to explode, Aaron. I think that area, you might have heard of like um, a company called Subtle Medical. They they can take a very, very low dose of contrast and like augment it and make the vessels much brighter, you know? And you can imagine like there's a lot of applications for that kind of thing. Uh, or they can take some signal to noise problems where you have motion artifact or what have you, and you can make the, all of that go away, you know? Interesting. Yeah, it's There's like modern many. day photography, basically, you know? Yes, it is. Let's talk about the mission of Cure, which is to make healthcare more globally accessible and affordable. And then let's jump into the products. Yeah, so Cure started, it was a group of computer scientists in India from elite level background. You know, they came from the best schools, 
at, at, at the top of their class. And at the time, you know, it was the early days. They said, we want to do healthcare and we want to do AI. And if it was you and me, Aaron, in India at that time, we would have chosen the same use case as that, which was TB, tuberculosis, is the number one killer as infectious disease outside, uh, you know, outside the U.S., where we have very low levels, which actually are rising now. But um, it was a perfect use case because also x-ray radiology is a perfect screening tool. And so the initial days helping patients from that perspective, like the goal was eradicate TB. Like what a what an audacious and yet fantastic goal that would be to eliminate, you know, the number one killer as uh, in the world, infectious disease wise. And so Cure's algorithms got so good that they basically were allowed by the WHO, World Health Organization, to be read without a human reader. Again, this is not the U.S. This is not, you know, this is low resource areas where they don't have radiologists everywhere. But like no human reader, that's how good it was and how important it was. And it basically changed Cure changed the way TB was handled, you know, like now you really involve Cure right at the onset and the time to treatment has reduced so much that although it's still a huge problem, it's still the number one killer, you know, we haven't eradicated it yet. That kind of audacious goal has driven Prashant Warrior, you know, the CEO to address every other kind of issue that um, we want to we want to address. I will tell you that experience. We have seventy such coders now. You know, instead of a small group, and this is like India's best talent uh, in computer science. They are just the creme de la creme, and the, they uh, we we have always been kind of the plain film AI because of our TB background, because of the initial applications. Plain film's hard. Plain film's harder than CT. So it's like biting off the hardest problem first. But that's where we are. We, we really focus on um, plain foam. And that's why we developed so many chest X-ray algorithms. However, because of our size now, we're in 90 plus countries. We're in over 2,700 healthcare sites. We have gone into CT. We have a neuro suite. So our neuro algorithms, it, it, this is a really interesting story. For our neuro algorithms, we ended up going to VRAD as a partner to hone that. And not a lot of people know that uh, because, because the, the RADs aren't necessarily exposed to that. They know AI is helping them, but they don't know it's cure, for example. But VRAD processes a million head CTs a year. And so they actually started with VRAD. By the time I'd, I'd left, I was already at RAD Partners by then. And... um they were doing a million head CTs a year. You, can you imagine how you can hone your algorithm? And it was a perfect use case, Aaron. Why? Because of all practices, what practices has more than a double the rate of head bleeds than any other practice? An emergency radiology practice centered at working at nights, weekends, and holidays, right? And so the incidence of head bleeds was perfect because it trained that algorithm to be super, super precise. And so, you know, the engineers, they were so smart that they kind of said, you know, we, we see a lot of these reports end up getting addended for um, fractures that you kind of don't see. And fractures obviously are the reason these folks are bleeding in the head. Let's develop a fracture detector. And so they actually developed a fracture detector at the same time so they can find a cranial fracture on the axial images, which, you know, you or I might blow by. It's just the way it is. And so, again, we have a lot of algorithms. We have 13 in the U.S., seven of them are for for head CT. Outside the U.S., we are very, very big in stroke. So, you know, here in the U.S., you have uh, ADOT, Viz, they have uh, um, um, a lot of hospitals have one of those uh, paradigms or rapid to uh, address stroke. Outside the U.S., you know, if they use us, we have an app that's actually very, very similar to Viz's app. But imagine a country that doesn't have an EMR. So you can actually follow the patient from when they actually develop stroke symptoms to when they get into an emergency room in India where they don't have an EMR, right? 
And you can have this app, this mobile app, does all the things like the, the biz app, like a chat function, imaging, reports, everything. And the docs can follow that patient to the mechanical thrombectomy and outcome. And it's all done on the app. And so I look at this app that Cure has developed and poured resources into to kind of say, hey, we don't have these fancy EMRs that the rest of the world does. Let's develop something because everybody's got one of these. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And it's interesting to me because we've kind of ignored that in the U.S., right? Like as a radiologist, yeah. when I read, Aaron, the first thing I do is I chuck my phone and throw it on the couch yeah, on yeah. silent. Right. Because right. I got to so go. You can't have that distraction. Yeah. I can't have a distraction of the phone, right? Yeah. And I'm always distracted by my phone when I'm not reading. I'll, I'll be yeah. very honest with you. Yeah. But not when I'm reading, I can't, right? No. So, no. It's like, yeah, it's like doing it while you're driving or worse, right? I mean, because, uh, yeah. So, well, that's, that's super interesting because like you guys have this global approach uh, and you're not like super focused on the U.S., which it seems like, and I, I could be wrong, but it seems like Viz, the other ones that we've mentioned are focused on the U.S. market. What is well, the competition like? Uh, that's kind of why I'm here is to... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Help cure getting into the US market. And I'll tell you, that's why we're focusing on plain comb. Because from from me and for cure, what we hear from radiologists is they're drowning in plain films. Yeah. And Aaron, it goes back to that RBU based system, right? Right. Right. Nobody wants to read them. Nobody wants to they take too much time. Even though they're so quick to read, it's too much time for the super low reimbursement. And so that creates this perfect, perfect sphere. And he, Here's the other part of X-ray and why it's so perfect for AI and for us to come in. It's filled with tedium, filled with tedium. You need to tell them that the catheter tips at the SBCRA junction, AI can do that for you, right? Like cardiomegaly, something simple like that. We actually have uh, an FDA cleared algorithm and it actually accounts for AP magnification on portable chest. And it just looks at the ratio of the heart size to the uh, thoracic to the rib cage, and gives you a, a, that ratio and say, you know, based on how big it is, you can say mild, moderate, or severe cardiomegaly. I never have to look. I never have to look at the heart size. It's just done. And then, you know, as practice, I mean, if you remember, COVID was such a disruptor. We were headed in 2018, 2019, 2020, early 2020 towards this state where things were getting really busy and then COVID just stopped it. So we had a reprieve and like the shortage wasn't felt. And now after COVID, we're like right. drowning. Bonkers. Yeah. Bonkers. So what you don't want is that outpatient film because you're focused on stats and inpatients where you have like a 17 year old with pneumonia or a spontaneous pneumothorax that's going to wait for four days for somebody to look at that thumb. You don't want that to happen. No, no. And so that's where we come in. So we think that, um, you know, this space is, is, is really open for us to help radiologists. Because, because yeah, you're right. I mean, the rest of those companies, as far as I can tell, are focused on the strokes, the PEs, the, the, the higher real estate kind of stuff Correct. that requires a, a, an immediate intervention, basically. Right. Yeah, it's so ironic because people are like, "Oh, you're doing kind of the low end stuff, the low hanging fruit." I'm it's, like, "Play film AI." Fruit. Yeah. Yes, it is the low hanging fruit, but it's this super hard. It might be why a lot of AI folks didn't touch plain yeah. film initially because yeah. it's very difficult, and that's where we're tackling. And um, but it's it's the key problem, I think. For, that's for really last. yeah, that's really neat. Um, I hadn't heard that approach yet, but but yet that's what everybody's waiting for. They're like, hey, when can this stack of x-rays be the, you know, I have a hundred x-rays here. I'm like sweating, just thinking about it. What, at what point can that AI just take care of that? So I can focus on the MRIs on the list. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and let me tell you an interesting way we're approaching things. You know, the other thing that's kind of, uh, killing rads is like all the screening lung cancer CTs. I don't know oh, if you read gosh. those. Oh, okay. They're brutal. Brutal, brutal. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> nodules in general, like yeah. all over the place. So, you know, we've started at x-ray and this is an interesting statistic. I'm, I, I didn't know this, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're going to be blown away by it. 90% of malpractice cases 
that involve the chest are from missed nodules on plankton. And I will tell you that we as radiologists, we miss nodules on plankton all the time. Uh, but that problem has been exacerbated by two things. One, the speed at which we read. You know, our search patterns have changed. And I can actually go into that with you, how our search patterns have changed. And then two, younger rats, they just don't have as much experience as older rats when it comes to plankton. They're just not exposed to it as much. And so they don't know those tricky places that nodules hide on the surface of the diaphragm or behind the clavicle, these hidden spots so they, they don't look at them. And I, um, we miss a lot of nodules, a lot. That's crazy. And yes, it's crazy. So we developed this nodule detector. And when you develop a nodule detector, what you don't want to do is irritate a rad with false positives, right? Right. Whether like it's cat. rounded atelectasis or a nipple shadow or a granuloma, if you start telling me about those things as nodules, I'm going to take your AI and throw it in the garbage, right? So we developed this thing and it is pretty awesome. Zero false positives when we, when we use it and um, about 95% of the nodules that are missed by rads, it's found. And, and I'll tell you why it's a great use case, because these are actually early lung cancers. And if you find lung cancers early, patients can live. It's like pancreatic cancer, right? Like you find it early, patients get a Whipple, they live. Find it uh, at, at the usual way when patient has hemoptysis or symptoms or something like that, the outcomes are dismal. But what we're going to do is we start with plain film, then we're going to bring our CT, lung cancer screening and incidental nodule detector, where we do take all the pain away from radiologists. We, we take all the measurements, we take volume doubling time, of, and we actually even characterize the nodule for the RADs, and then we put it all in their report. That's amazing. I, I, got, a, I got a fun little side story. So I, I think I told you, I did radiology residency at Pensy uh, in Philly. And at the time, our program director did not want us moonlighting. He, did, he didn't want us the distraction of moonlighting or whatever. So I found uh, my own gig with, actually, it was, it was a gig that was handed down from Res year to year resonance, and it, we had a high volume. There was a cancer center there, and one of the uh, I forget if he, yeah, it was only one of the oncologists. He had a, a number of um, lung cancer patients who, uh, and actually a variety of cancer patients who had metastatic disease in the lung, and he needed people because the CT of the chest would get read right out as lung nodules are stable or multiple lung nodules. A few are bigger, a few are smaller, whatever. But he was like, no, 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 I need every single nodule measured and accounted for. And so he would pay the residents to go through and do that, right? <laughs> and and it was that was our moonlighting. And um, awesome. and I, so when I think of these, you know, can these uh, metastatic, you know, nodules or just you know nodules in general, I always think about that and how tedious it was. You know, at the time, felt like good money, but. Definitely not worth it these days. Yeah, when we, when we were designing this thing, the engineers are like, you know, this is not a two D measurement. You know, like yeah, a module yeah. is lives right. in three D space in your lung. It's a volume, and right. you know, we do these two D measurements, and they're super inaccurate. You know, the engineers look at us and they're like, why do you rads work the way you do? And so when we're designing this thing, like they will give you the lung rads measurement, which is short axis, long axis, average, and yeah. put it in the report. But the real thing that they care about is volume, right? Like yeah. how is it tracking from the priors and how is it growing? And that's what the lung uh, surgeons want to know. That's what the pulmonologists, interventional pul pulmonologists want to know. They want to know the growth rate of these nodules. Yeah. And then the guidelines and the recommendations and keeping up with that and just having that be automated so that you don't have to go look it up or it's not, you know, you got to redo your macro every two years, you know, it's yeah. like, it's just automatic. I, I, I mean, I read, I, like when I get a journal or something and I see every single F issue, it seems like, oh, we propose a new, you know, lexicon for staging X, Y, or Z. And I'm like, you're killing us, you know, you're right. like killing You can't them. keep track of it all. Whether it be thi thyroid, lung, yeah. liver, it's just, there's always, there's a new, 
Tyrads, Lyrads, what, you know, it's just, it is something it's yeah. difficult to keep up with it. And so, yeah, if, when that information comes out and it's in the literature and it's, you know, there's consensus on it, it's consensus guidelines. Basically, I, AI takes that and just directly applies it. That would be amazing, right? Yep. That's, that's where we're headed. And so my, you know, we're actually coming up on the hour, but I, I got a few more questions here because one key thing that you mentioned is how the younger rads are not getting appropriate training in certain areas like radiographs. And I mean, you know, it depends on the program, depends on the volume. But one thing that I, and I actually asked this on the um, ACR forum once is like, hey, are there, are training programs incorporating any sort of AI curriculum so that they know how to interact with, and I imagine some of the departments are probably, you know, they, they're probably giving them access to, you know, they're, they're including this and so forth in their, in their workflows. But I'm just wondering, like, are, are radiology residents being taught this stuff at no. all? No, they, they are really not. Uh, the, the exposure to AI is, even at the big academic places, they don't use AI really a lot in practice. It's actually at, you know, private practices where, you know, they have multiple, multiple AI tools because the need for efficient. And I will tell you, I think it's really important because there's a learning curve with AI. You need to know. It takes time. How do I know to trust it, right? Like, there's, that comes with time. How do I know when it does a bad job, you know? I remember when I first started using a head bleed algorithm, I'm like, how does it know this is not choroid plexus? And you just, like, learn uh, when it's going to be right, when it's going to be wrong, and that makes you a better radiologist, first of all. So it's really, really good learning. And, and, and although I disparage the younger rads when it comes to plain film, they are m much better that, at CT than I was coming out of training. They are super good at CT right off the bat. Like, no question about it. If you actually look at their uh, training and uh, what they do, what they come out with versus when I came out with, obviously I'm an old fogey, but still, you know, it, it, I think that you get trained. You get trained in radiology and your brain uses what it needs to use. It doesn't, it sees that, I think part of it, honestly, Aaron, is they are smart enough to know that, like, I don't need to go overboard on the x-ray for two reasons. One, a CT is probably coming. <laughs> and then two, nobody may read my report anyway, you know? So I think all of that factors in to uh, what they pay attention to. Yeah. Well, I mean, because that's the other question is like, like you said, you, it sounds like, and I haven't been to RSNA yet, but it sounds like you go there and you see all these AI boosts and everything. And as a resident, I would think, I mean, because when I was an IR fellow, I was, I wanted to check out all the new devices, right? Yeah. As a, as a, as a radiology resident, I would think that you'd just be like, I want to get to know this AI yeah. stuff, you know? And so I, that's why I'm always curious, like, is it part, is it being part built into their curriculums? But Everybody I talk to says pretty much no. Yeah, you know, I've looked a lot into it. Um, I think I think Penn is is really starting to to say hey, we need to train uh, folks in in how to be um, savvy with with AI, and I think it's coming. You know, it's just natural that it, that it hasn't been here because, like some of these big research institutions, they're incredible. They they have tremendous exposure to all the AI companies and et cetera but they don't use it in the day-to-day. -day. They use it in their research packs or in their, you know, in an isolated fashion somewhere else. But the day-to-day -day resident use, they're like, I've and I've pulled residents left and right. And they're like, I'm not using any AI. Vi you know, Viz, they may not see it in the radiology reading room. You know, the, 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 the neurologists may see it, you know, the neurology residents and the neurosurgery residents, but not the radiology folks. So I think that's where we're headed. It will be changed. I will tell you that my CEO and Elad uh, have both said the same thing, that like we're coming along a time where like 80 to 90% of all these AI companies, a lot of them mom and pop, are going to not exist any in the future, you know? So we're going to be in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a very hectic time. And so it's good that we're talking about AI. No, it's great. I mean, I, you know... Because I, like you, I still kind of read and 
yeah, you know, because I'm an IR, just ba- yeah. you know, the basics, right? But that being said, it's that's why I'm really the AI is kind of what I get most excited about when I think of diagnostic radiology because of all these things that are happening. Any so like any essential so p- for people like me who want to learn more, like any essential info that that we've left out that maybe could help docs learn more. You know, whether they already are incorporating it or they want to you know, learn more? Like, is there anywhere where you direct people to like, kind of take a deeper dive into this? Yeah. I say one, use chat GPT every day. Uh, That's what Matt said too. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We actually, I I think we even talked about that and we both tell our kids even, you know, like use it for some issue every day so that you become really good at prompts and uh, train your mind. And then if you're part of a private practice group or, or, or someplace that hasn't exposed you enough to AI, get on it. It's it, AI has turned the corner, you know, it, it, it can help us be more efficient. You know, I, I think you saw my podcast with Harry that I, I'm a believer, a true believer and, um, know it. I've, I've measured my times, you know, and it's, uh, it's making me efficient. So now yeah. we need it. We're drowning, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so that, um, that will make you better. And, and that's the thing is like, being exposed to AI is super important to learn how to use it. It's, it's a tool like any other. You even said, I learned to use PowerScribe. I, I, uh, we became efficient. We developed our macros. You, you develop your tools. Right. And this is a tool that can be developed. Can be developed, yeah. And obviously, you just got to play with it, just like everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Samir, so one last thing is like uh, for, for with Cure, let's say there's a, a group out there that wants to learn more. How do you direct you tell them to like email you or reach out like what's the best way for anybody to sort of learn more about cure.ai yes please email me but i mean it's got a super easy website www.cure.ai i mean it couldn't be easier q with a q, q for cure and i would say that uh email me samir.shah at cure.ai s-a-m-i-r dot s-h-a-h at cure.ai i'll give it out um, um to anybody and they can uh email me for more information, um, we are going to grow a lot in the U.S. and you're going to be hearing about us. If you don't find us, we'll find you. Yeah. And one more question. RSNA is a big one, but not everybody can go to that. Where, where else do you guys set up booths and, you know, make a presence uh, in terms of yeah. conferences? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I would say the two areas that we have our FDA clearances is where you're going to see us. So, you know, um, all the neuro conferences. Um, I'll be at Eastern Neuro in August, for example, and then, um, all the chest conferences. So we were at Society for Thoracic Radiology. Uh, we're even, you know, talking to getting AI into the hospital, Aaron, is a big process. It's not just radiology. So we have to talk to pulmonologists. We have to talk to thoracic surgeons. We have to talk to IT. So we're at SIM and HIMSS. And then we have to talk to admin. They are all very skeptical and rightly so, you know, how can I blame anyone? Cause I was a skeptic. Right. And now I'm the CMO of an AI company. Right. So like, I think that, uh, that's the key is, uh, it's a multi-pronged approach. Uh, they got to trust that, uh, that, that this stuff can help. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Samir, thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate all the insights. And, uh, like I said, everybody check out those episodes with Chris Mancy, Leelon Wallach, with uh, Matt Lundgren, with Wujin Kim. Um, excited to keep the conversation going. Love Backtable. I'm a huge <laughs> fan. You're, you're the best, Aaron. Thanks, Samir. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at Backtable Innovation on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable Innovation is produced and hosted by Brian Hartley, Aaron Fritz, Diana Velasquez-Pimentel, and Eric Yamaker. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Josh Spencer. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Willie Kennebrew. Thanks again for listening. See you again next week.